Liberty Nation with Tim Donner. As we've discussed today, an awful lot of attention is rightfully focused on China these days because of the COVID pandemic. But there have been a few canaries in the coal mine, so to speak, on the danger of our present relationship with China long before now. Our dependence on them for medicines and pharmaceuticals, their theft of intellectual property, their cheap labor, undercutting the American workforce. But the man who joins us now was crying foul about a scandalously overlooked part of our relationship with China long before this pandemic. And now he's pushing the Trump administration and others to replicate what he helped President Ronald Reagan achieve many years ago, bring down an empire through financial and fiscal strategies. Roger Robinson is co-founder and chairman of the Prague Security Studies Institute and just as important, if not more, served as Senior Director of International Economic Affairs on President Reagan's National Security Council, and he joins us now. Roger Robinson, welcome to Liberty Nation Radio. Thank you, Tim. Now, outline for us why it's not trade deals or tariffs or intellectual property or international denunciation that will bring the Chinese to heel, but hard currency, or more precisely, a lack thereof. In some ways, it's similar to the Soviet experience, Tim. I mean, for example, the Soviet Union and China both do not have convertible currencies. So they are at a distinct disadvantage. We utterly dominate the economic and financial domain on this planet. And they have, in the case of the Soviets, had paltry little in the way of hard currency income. We were able to turn that to our great advantage and basically put clamps on the life support tubes that were keeping the Soviets a going concern. I mean, it turned out that we were financing 100% of their uh, shortfalls in hard currency through Western governments and banks. Well, in in the China case, it's a different deal I mean, they obviously have a much more diversified economy, and uh, you can't even compare in terms of the size and depth of, uh, of the economic systems. But nevertheless, they have a command economy, uh, just like the Soviets did, <clears throat> and it has all of the kind of rigidities uh, that they did as well. But here's the thing. My greatest fear is that the money which is the essence of how these communist societies remain uh, a threat to us and a going concern, has been systematically overlooked. For example, uh, we've never had a screening mechanism up over our capital markets, which are the large, our capital markets are larger than the rest of the world's combined. And in the trade category, you know that we have the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States, We have a screening mechanism that looks at Chinese investment in the U.S. from a national security lens. None of that ever has existed for the last 25 years on China. The American people and our government have no idea of who these Chinese companies are who penetrated our capital markets. There are well over a thousand of them in our markets right now. Uh, Nobody, again, not only looked at whether they were bad actors, from a national security and human rights point of view, but they didn't even care from an investor protection perspective. They didn't, they weren't subject to a public company, the auditing oversight committee, for example, the, the Sarbanes-Oxley Act or Dodd-Frank, no matter what you think about legislation, nevertheless, they are federal securities laws. The Chinese are non-compliant. They don't even share their financials. It, it, they consider them state secrets. The whole thing is a black box. And when we finally looked into that black box and looked at these companies strand by strand, what did we find? We found that they have PLA-affiliated firms that are building the advanced weapon systems designed to kill our men and women in uniform. They, have, they are equipping uh, things like the concentration camps with their surveillance cameras and the like in Xinjiang, where a million and a half Uyghurs are held behind those walls. Uh, They have sanctions violators. There are even U.S. sanctioned Chinese and Russian companies in our capital markets 
because we never took the time to have a to scrutinize who these folks are. And now they're sitting in the portfolios of some 160 a million unwitting American investors. Now, you point out in your writing, which is something that I've observed and wondered about for years, that virtually every administration, Republican and Democrat, has let China get away with everything, almost unchallenged. And the Europeans thought they could buy their way into China's heart. Why the stubborn resistance for all those years to holding China to account? I really am concerned that it's 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 the one portfolio that Wall Street and others didn't want us to focus on. They're the they're fine having us look at trade and even the tariff issue. They're fine having us look at technology security and the fact that these dual use dangerous technologies not go to China. On the other hand, they have protected steadfastly the large fees that are being derived from the debt and equity offerings of Chinese companies in our markets. Tim, they have taken as much as $3 trillion out of the United States in terms of stock and bond offerings. We always wonder about how they seem to have an unlimited checking account available to capture nations, regions, and even continents in the case of Africa. This is the sad truth, that that money is in large part ours. And and this is the dirty little secret, if I, if I will say, except it's of a vast scale. This is what where the, where the Chinese live or die, just as it was the Soviets. And the China lobby and those that want to profit from that relationship have such a vice-like grip on American policy, and the financial side has been so poorly misunderstood, so poorly understood by the national security community that they have not let the nickel drop on that particular area of the bilateral relationship. So tell us now what you're doing to try and reverse this. You're working hard, particularly on the federal thrift savings plan as a way to put a big dent in the Chinese economy. What is the federal thrift savings plan and why is it central to your plan? Well, the, the federal retirement thrift savings plan is in effect the 401k retirement system for 5.8 million American federal employees. It's about a $700 billion fund. In that, in that array of portfolio options, there's something called an international fund, the so-called I-Fund. It's $50 billion. The board that administers the thrift savings plan had the terribly wrong-headed idea to move that money from a developed country only index, that is the companies of only developed industrialized democracies, for example, to an index called the MSCI All Country World ex-U.S. index, kind of a long, complicated name, but the essence of it is it's expanded to emerging markets that include China and Russia. And over 11% of that index is invested in Chinese companies, many of them, or several of them, sanctioned by the United States for national security and egregious human rights abuses. And we have a real chance to stop the movement of that $50 billion into an index that is going to be, that's going to mean that we, those 5.8 million American federal employees are investing in these odious and destructive Chinese entities. The national security community is very much with us on this as, as is the military and There's been a campaign to try to move the dial and get this thing stopped. Well, Roger, this has been fascinating. Thanks for illuminating us on this, and best of luck, and I mean that seriously, in your efforts to raise awareness of this and then to get something done about it. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Tim.
Roger Robinson, senior member of President Reagan's national security team, now heading the effort to pull American investment out of China.